Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us on this Wednesday evening for uh, an event sponsored by Ceres, uh, Leadership in Action, Tackling Climate Change as an Economic Opportunity. And we're so happy to have you here at the U.S. Center. We really appreciate uh, expanding the conversation on, on climate change and, and having your engagement in our side events. Uh, thank you also to our audience joining via the web. We hope that you'll participate in the conversation and tweet hashtag you ask US Center. So hashtag ask US Center if you have any questions uh, for the panelists. My name's Ashley Allen and I'm with the White House Council on Environmental Quality and I'm pleased to be your uh, mistress of ceremonies today. So to start today, I'm um, pleased to introduce to you Chair Nancy Sutley of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, she is the principal environmental policy advisor to President Obama and she helps to develop and coordinate the administration's environmental and energy policies and initiatives. Under her leadership, CEQ, the Council on Environmental Quality, has launched a federal sustainability initiative that has reduced the, government's, the U.S. government's emissions by 15%, and among other accomplishments, also created the first ever federal agency climate change resilience plans. Uh, prior to her appointment at CEQ, Chair Sutley was the Deputy Mayor for Energy and Environment for the City of Los Angeles and also held positions uh, at the EPA and in the uh, Governor of California's office. Uh, Chair Sutley. Thanks very much and good evening to all of you and uh, thank you to, to, uh, to Lance, there you are, uh, to, uh, inviting me, for inviting me uh, to speak as a part of this uh, very important event and uh, to the other panelists as well. It's great to have you uh, here at the U.S. Center uh, talking about the very um, important work that uh, you're doing in your companies and as part of Ceres. And I certainly value uh, Ceres as a, a leader in engaging the private sector in climate action. And you know you, uh, there have been a lot of uh, very significant initiatives, um, including the Investor Network on Climate Risk and the biannual United Nations Investor Summit and the Global Reporting Initiative. In particular, uh, Ceres leadership has uh, been the impetus for the formation of the Business for Innovative Climate and Energy Policy, or BICEP Coalition and the Climate uh, Declaration. Um, in June, the President Obama launched his climate action plan to cut carbon pollution to prepare the U.S. for the impacts of climate change and to show leadership with our international partners uh, globally to confront this important global challenge. And in his uh, speech at Georgetown University in June on a very, very hot day, uh, he recognized um, what is now more than 700 businesses uh, companies like GM and Nike, Walmart, Unilever, and Ikea that have signed on to this climate declaration that calls for action on climate change, calls action on climate change one of the great economic opportunities of the 21st century. And in his speech, the President also highlighted an example, and that is Walmart's goal uh, to transition completely to renewable energy and cut emissions 20 percent. And he said, Walmart deserves a cheer for that, but think about it. Would the biggest company, the biggest retailer in America, would they really do it that if it weren't good for business, if it weren't good for their shareholders? We believe that a low carbon, clean energy economy can be an engine for growth for decades to come. And uh, thanks to many of you, uh, businesses across the United States are seizing this opportunity to build that future. And we've seen time and time again in the United States that when we ask businesses to innovate and reduce pollution, they meet the challenge. In the 1990s, we took steps to reduce acid rain, and there were naysayers who said our electric bills would go up and business and our economy would suffer. That didn't happen, and we reduced acid rain dramatically and at far less cost than an originally expected. We restricted cancer-causing chemicals in plastics, and we removed lead from fuel, and we phased out CFCs from refrigerants, and it didn't end any of those industries. A couple of years ago, uh, the Obama administration worked with the auto industry to put in place historic fuel economy standards, double fuel efficiency. 
And that did not cripple the auto industry, industry as some tried to claim it would. In fact, uh, two series member businesses, GM, General Motors, and Ford, serve as a good reminder of the resurgence of the American auto industry. And these fuel economy standards have driven them to develop better, more efficient, and more economical vehicles for consumers. We've always used new technology, new science, and innovation uh, to make it clear that we can grow our economy and protect our environment for future generations. And that remains true today. Today we're using more clean energy and wasting less energy. And our economy is 60% bigger than it was 20 years ago as our carbon emissions have dropped to roughly where they were 20 years ago. And in the last 44 months, the private sector in the U.S. has created 7.8 million jobs. Our gross domestic product has grown for 10 straight quarters. Our deficit, our federal budget deficits have been cut in half. Exports are up and the housing market is coming back. So I also wanted to say that with the measures that are laid out in the President's Climate Action Plan, we're on our way to meet President Obama's goal uh, that he committed to in Copenhagen to reduce our emissions in the range of 17% by 2020. Uh, another thing I would like to just call your attention to is about three years ago, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is the federal government Indus, uh, financial industry watchdog issued guidance on uh, existing disclosure rules which clarifies that companies should disclose the impact that businesses or legal developments related to climate change may have on their business, including the impact of climate change related legislation or regulation and in international accords or consequences of regulation or business trends, and importantly, the physical impacts of climate change. So the U.S. is, is uh, stepping up, as many of you are, to create clean, energy-efficient products and technologies that will transform our energy sector and our economy and help avoid leaving a planet that is too, that is polluted or damaged, and, and, and at the same time doing what's best for our consumers. Under the President's plan, we're committed to cutting carbon pollution, including for the first time putting in place limits on carbon pollution from new and existing power plants, improving our energy efficiency, and reducing the amount of energy we waste in our cars, in our homes, and in our businesses, and leading by example in our federal buildings and operations. We, we recognize that some impacts of climate change are already affecting communities across the world, and we've taken actions to prepare for the impacts that we can't avoid. Earlier this month, President Obama signed an executive order on preparing the United States for the impacts of climate change. And this directive uh, asks it, the federal government to take a number of steps to make it easier for American communities to strengthen their resilience to extreme weather and prepare for other impacts of climate change. And this brings me to the last piece of the Climate Action Plan and the reason uh, we are here in Warsaw with you. We know that just as no one company or, or one country is, a, is immune from the impacts of climate change, no one company, no one country can confront this challenge alone. It was, must be a collaborative effort between public, nonprofit, private sectors, at home, and internationally. We have the ability to move the market in terms of renewable energy, green buildings, and sustainable acquisitions working together. So uh, we look forward to continuing the work with, with series organizations and other uh, climate advocates to ensure our sustainable future. So thank you for the work that you all are, are all doing. Um, look forward to the discussion and look forward to uh, continuing the kind of public and private partnerships that are gonna make a real difference. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, now I'm pleased to introduce to you uh, Lance Pierce, who will be moderating this event. Uh, Lance is the executive director of Ceres, and he oversees programs, operations, and strategic planning. He has worked in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors, so right along with uh, all the collaboration that uh, Chair Sutley just mentioned. 
and uh, much of his professional background has focused on sustainable development and corporate social responsibility. He began his career in sustainable development, uh, having been a principal of a consultancy working with the United Nations agencies and leading international development NGOs and serving in the Peace Corps. Lance. Thank you very much, and thank you, Nancy, for your kind remarks about, uh, about series and about uh, our panel today. Um, so this panel really is about um, business engaging in policy, and it's about business taking action on sustainability in general and climate change in particular uh, for reasons that are integral to their business. And uh, we have a, a wonderful panel here today. Um, I should just say as well that uh, this is my fourth COP. I've been here for about a week. And the themes of business engaging uh, in this venue are much more in evidence than I've seen uh, really at any of the other COPs that I've been to. So I think uh, I'm hoping that uh, this panel will uh, continue to deepen this discussion that, that we've been having thus far. So uh, before I uh, introduce uh, our esteemed panelists, let me just tell you just uh, very briefly who Ceres is. Um, so Ceres is a, we're an NGO, um, and we focus uh, on a range of core sustainability issues. We focus on climate change, we focus on cleaner energy, we focus on water, and, uh, and a range of issues uh, around sustainability in corporate supply chains. And we begin by focusing on uh, key stakeholder issues, so we try to look for uh, where are the stakeholders affected uh, by particular company actions that may pertain to any of those issue areas. Uh, we then try to uh, reach out to investors. We've organized a base of investors with whom we work. Uh, the Investor Network on Climate Risk is a leading coalition uh, uh, focused on uh, trying to engage investors in, uh, in sustainable investing and in uh, action on climate. Uh, and from there, we work our way to companies. We have a network of over 60 companies who are, are series member companies, and we have uh, 30 companies in our BICEP coalition and over 700 companies in our uh, climate declaration. And, uh, and if we're successful in working uh, within those institutions and on those issues of sustainability, uh, we're often able to move them to focus on the external issues of the day, most frequently policy. And so that does bring us here today. And um, uh, in the spring of last year, Ceres uh, Bicep Coalition launched something that we call the Climate Declaration. It's a very simple statement uh, that tackling climate change is one of America's greatest economic opportunities, and it's simply the right thing to do. Um, we were expecting that this pledge was going to uh, take, we'd hoped that we were going to get uh, 100 companies in, in 100 days. Uh, to sign up to this. We got 100 companies to sign up uh, within the first week, uh, and it's only grown from there. And uh, so uh, companies are stepping out in the absence of policy frameworks. I think we all know that that's one of the big debates, one of the big sticking issues in the, in the climate debate, not just domestically in the United States, but internationally as well. The, the lack of complete policies, consistent policies across uh, various geographies in which global companies operate, and the need for that not just to give business consistency and the signals that they need to do their, to, to conduct their business, but also uh, because uh, it, it, it uh, is actually what's going to be required to really tackle the issue of climate change. Um, so uh, you can see uh, a range of some of the companies and brands who have signed on to, uh, to the climate declaration. Uh, we have a few of those companies up here today and who will be talking a little bit about uh, some of the work that they're doing. So let me, uh, without further ado, introduce uh, our panelists. So sitting here uh, to my far left uh, is Steve Howard, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer of IKEA Group. Uh, Steve uh, is uh, also a member of the company's group uh, management uh, and is previously the founder and CEO of the Climate Group. Uh, and he's now a member of their International Leadership Council. Uh, and sitting uh, next to him is uh, Harry Verhar. Uh, Harry is, uh, has over 20 years of experience in the lighting industry and is the head of global public and government affairs for Philips Lighting. Uh, he deals with all of their strategy, uh, outreach, and stakeholder management on, on energy and climate change and sustainable development. Uh, and he was also a recipient of the 2011 UN Leader of Change Award and also received the Carbon War Room Gigaton Award on behalf of Philips. And uh, sitting uh, just immediately to my left is uh, Thomas Lingard, who's the Global Advocacy Director of Unilever. And he's the, uh, he, he, he directs all external affairs uh, globally at Unilever with a particular responsibility on uh, sustainability and climate change. Uh, he spent two years on secondment uh, 
as Deputy Director of the Green Alliance, an environmental think tank, uh, where he oversaw the development of the organization's three-year strategy and led their policy team. And so um, these are companies who have found it uh, in their self-interest to take action on climate change, even absent framework policies. And um, it, it, given the, the prominence of this theme at this year's COP, we wanted to give them an opportunity to tell you a little bit about why that is, what they're seeing, and um, I would ask the panelists if we can move um, quickly through your slides uh, to make sure that we leave enough time for Q&A from the audience and as well from uh, others who might want to submit something from online from the, uh, the audience watching the stream. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to, uh, yes, there they are, uh, all of our panelists. Uh, you can see them, but they are exactly the same people I said they were. <laughs> and uh, we're going to turn it over now to Harry, who's going to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Phillips and the work that they're doing. Harry. I'll stay with Steve. Uh, so, oh yeah. So yeah, just a few things on uh, what we now call the LED revolution, because a revolution it is, uh, and actually how things started and how they worked out. Also with a little, uh, let's say, look at the United States. So it's, it's exactly ten years ago <coughs> that, from uh, when I had a marketing responsibility in Europe, that I started our program on energy and climate change. And my view at that time, so the European Parliament was at that time thinking about how to translate the Kyoto Treaty in European legislation. So my view was, yeah, we can do two things. We can duck and say that in our sector, the lighting sector, everything is fine. Voluntary measures will be sufficient. But then still had there might be <coughs> bureaucracy or rather, let's say, viewpoints that it would not be in line with reality and would not be beneficial for the industry. So then my view was uh, we need to step up, we need to show how much lighting matters, how much we can contribute actually tackling this issue. Uh, and we brought the industry together, so together with other industry partners, Osram, GE, uh, and all the rest. And I repeated the story, I had to do a little bit pushing and pulling. Over time, have it then eventually everybody joined. What is important to note is that at that time, had then we, f we formulated that there are actually four drivers for change. Uh, those were years, uh, 2004, 5, and 6. There was a lot of emphasis on climate change. And I'm really concerned uh, that we need to accelerate action against it. But in reality, we have to recognize there are four drivers for change. So rising energy prices, which is fossil fuel as well as electricity. Indeed, climate change. Security of energy supply, which for some countries, uh, mostly Europe, US, and a few others, is also the increasing and high dependency on fossil fuel imports, uh, which are costly to the economy. But for other economies, it's like having 24-7 electricity available. So how can you cope uh, with the growing demand on electricity in emerging developing countries? The last one, economic growth, and it's simply there, and sometimes it's amazing how long it takes before the penny drops, but if you waste more, less, less resources, less energy for the same product and service, it's more competitive. Uh, but secondly, also, if you renovate existing infrastructure, and I'll say something about it later on, it creates jobs and also economic prosperity. And an important factor, and that's also for parts on the slide, if you need less power, you don't have to invest that much in power infrastructure, and you can use it for healthcare, education, and other things that matter. So as you see there, we calculated the whole global installed lighting base, made projections, scenarios, including population growth, urbanization, everything. And then we came to these numbers that are quite frequently used, that lighting is 19% of global electricity. At that time, about a quarter was, was relatively efficient. So if you switch everything, also taking into account when can you really dim the street lights, everything, so all detail included, you can save on average 40% after a project, sometimes 80 or 90. And that equates to a lot of money. So I should have put dollars there. I think this is the slide <laughs> with euros. But it's about $170 billion that can be saved globally by switching. And about a quarter of that is for the US. It's also equivalent uh, to 640 power plants, well knowing uh, that those are at least a billion uh, or a billion and a half each, and uh, that's a trillion dollars that can be saved. Again, a quarter in the US. It's also a lot of carbon, 670 megatons. So this became, actually had the, the core of the approach, and we did this in actually all European countries, US, countries around the world, and what was interesting was to notice that the four drivers are valid everywhere, be it in a different priority order. But the solution is always the same. So move faster to energy efficient solutions. 
In fact, uh, maybe a brief word, because uh, many people focus on policies, uh, certainly here in the stadium. The program contains three core elements. So one is, importantly, how do we motivate people in the value chain to make the switch? So how do you work on the behavior? So you could say this is a bit of the marketing agenda. You focus on the benefits. Uh, people don't buy lighting to be energy efficient. They buy it because it has a certain purpose. Uh, they want to be able to read or to work or to drive safety through streets. So that's what the focus should be. How do you improve that? Secondly, to stimulate policy measures for part because of the, let's say, the science indicated uh, speed and depth of the transitions that are needed. But also, I would say, because we are humans uh, and our behavior is not always uh, then fully compliant with the logic, uh, and we certainly know that this, this week again. And thirdly, to put in place a number of enabling elements. So portfolio, supply chain, but also finance, partnerships. Uh, we became a partner of the Climate Group and Steve was CEO, also because of the belief, hey, we need to team up and then make a difference. So what happened initially, uh, I started a large PR campaign in 2005, that was, and actually our people in corporate communications felt, well, if you have five press clippings, it's a success. Well, in a matter of no time, we had a thousand uh, clippings in the press. It was really amazing. We had our CEO, I remember in October 2005, for the first time I took him to Brussels, to 21 media, a few people from the parliament, and he focused on street lighting, but also had the whole story with the four drivers. He said, yeah, but will people really listen? And I said, yeah, and in the end, you need to hold up the old type of street light and the smaller, better new one. And he, <coughs> he said, should I do that? He said, yes, you should do that. And he did it, and he held it up, and then the camera started flashing. And then being a good CEO, he got addicted to the attention, and that helped also a great deal in spreading the message internally as well as externally. Anyway, so this showed uh, we are really doing uh, what matters. And also the results here, one of the results over time is that across the globe, we see uh, there's legislation in place to phase out incandescent lighting. Incandescent lighting, or you could say residential lighting in our homes, uh, where we spend maybe sometimes too little time, that's about a quarter of the electricity consumption. And about 60% is in non-residential buildings, and about 15% uh, the lighting electricity is in outdoor. Interestingly, maybe a brief remark, in 2000, end of 2007, in December of 2006, we made a global call to phase out incandescent lighting. <coughs> and in Europe, the story was very much had a little bit of the climate change angle, uh, but also the other factors, but it became part of the European climate package. In the same year, in I think it was 15th of March, we made a similar call in Washington with Senator Bingaman. Uh, actually, it was a bipartisan approach. <coughs> and that resulted in December 2007 in a chapter in the Energy Independence and Security Act. And what was really interesting is that December 2007 was the same month, as some of you will remember, that the climate process got derailed from Bali, and actually had that maybe some of you were there, but let's say the US in general had got a bit of a, of a cheek uh, bashing, I think you call that, huh, for not being collaborative. But then in the same month, on December 19th, uh, George Bush signed the Energy Independence and Security Act, actually then phasing out the inefficient lighting and making major steps forward on energy efficiency. So in the meantime, just two, uh, two more slides. So this is an indication of, the, of, a, of an example of a partnership working with the Climate Group, also advocating the benefits of LED lighting across cities. And New York is one of the partners in this program. Uh, they just announced days ago that by 2017, all their street lighting will be LED based. Uh, so this is also, and part of this was also in uh, the opening ceremony of Climate Week New York City, together have with Todd Stern and others, and with Steve as well, we bumped into each other uh, for the good cause. Uh, so then really spreading the message. And what I did there is I actually focused, because many people don't speak Carbonish, uh, also some people in Europe don't speak Carbonish, I focused on the economics. And I said, indeed, if carbon doesn't matter to some, and then money will. And what we did there, and this is really also a political debate across the world, we said, okay, let's calculate the support of Ecofist to really uh, credibly underpin this. How much is the economic benefit uh, of making more, giving more action on energy efficiency, moving from one to 3% energy efficiency? And for the US, you see the numbers here in 2030, or 20, I think these are the, yeah, these are the 2030 numbers. If you move to 3% energy efficiency, which is peanuts, because uh, we ourselves as a company we are improving the efficiency of our portfolio from 2010 to 2015 by 50 percent, everything we do, healthcare, lighting, appliances. Uh, so that makes an annual difference of 550 million US dollars on the energy bill. It makes a difference huh, of a prevented investment of 900 billion. And you could say, hey, this is also good huh, for the debt ceiling. 
uh, but it also creates about one and a half million jobs. And those are particularly low and medium scale jobs of people who are getting unemployed uh, because of the economic crisis. So I think in that sense, uh, the message is, uh, let's focus on the drivers uh, that really matter. Also here, recognizing uh, that the right thing to do environmentally and certainly morally is also the right thing to do economically. So this is a lot that's happening, maybe two more numbers, and I think I've gone over time. <laughs> but two numbers that I announced yesterday in a panel uh, where I had, had was invited to with Ban Ki-moon and Christiana Figueres. Uh, on the lighting market, how fast the transition is going. So in 2006 and seven, the incandescent light bulb market was at a very stable level of 12 billion pieces per year, 12 billion. This year it's six. So in six years it's down to half. Also, because of all the changes that have occurred already, already programmed, and you don't really have to work hard for that anymore, but already programmed, is that the lighting sector will reduce energy consumption, electricity consumption, by 30% in 2020, so compared to 2006. And if you take into account population rise, urbanization, and all that, and call that business as usual, which no longer exists, then actually the reduction is 50, 50 uh, percent in 13 years. So I would say hey, there's reason for concern, there's reason to make a bigger effort and roll up our sleeves, but it can be done. So big steps are possible if we team up and if we make a difference hey, and we hope also there yeah, to inspire other sectors. So thank you. Wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about Unilever. Uh, we have a similar kind of logic, but it took us a bit longer to get there, I think, because of the nature of the products. It's we don't, we hadn't traditionally thought in that kind of full economic impact way, but we're getting there. And let me talk a little bit about that. So, um, our business makes uh, everyday products: shampoos, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, uh, toothpaste, that sort of thing. Um, put some up on the screen. So these are kind of everyday products, a very simple business in a way. We make this stuff, we sell it on to retailers, you buy it when you go to the grocery store. Um, and for a long time, um, businesses like ours saw primary responsibilities to be about what happens within our shop. So how we manage energy uh, and emissions from within our factories, and we got very, very good at that over a long period of time. Um, but what we saw happening as we did a strategic review looking to the future is we saw all of the stresses around climate, around particularly food supplies as a business heavily dependent on agricultural raw materials, and realized that something was just not adding up, that we needed a big strategic change of direction. And, and that led to the launch of the Sustainable Living Plan. Um, and, uh, and a new company mission around making sustainable living commonplace. So, And this is important because this isn't a sustainability strategy slogan. This is the new corporate mission. This is what Unilever is here to do. Um, and the strategy, which can be summarized very nicely with this very simple chart, is, is to double the size of the business, so a big um, economic growth imperative, increasing the positive social impact of the business, both to the value chains and of the products themselves, while at the same time reducing, um, in absolute terms, the environmental footprint. So this is kind of the very, very top line pitch. And when thinking about how to do that, we, we came to this value chain approach, which is implicit in what, in what Harry's talked about and Philip's. It's not just looking at us, but it's looking at what's the value chain of the product, what's the impact of the product when it goes into use, and also in the, in the manufacturing. And our products, I don't know, may be a little bit different. If, I don't know if we've done this full value chain mapping, but when we did this, and this is just for carbon you see on the screen, we found that actually the manufacturing emissions, although we've been managing them really well and getting really, really big numbers in terms of absolute reductions over the years, we're only 3% of the total footprint. About 26% were coming from agricultural raw materials and 68% was coming from when the consumer used our products in the home. And this basically comes down to the, the sort of emissions you get from agriculture uh, and all the inputs that go into that. And at the other end, um, the emissions from domestic energy consumption uh, when people use that. And that, as we know, is driven by you know, carbon grid intensity and so on. So um, we built uh, a big strategy. I won't do the full presentation now, but the business case for this, which is I think what we came here to talk about as an, an economic opportunity, um, looks a bit like this. So, and this is the same business case that we had previously, but we've understood <coughs> better through doing this process how we build sustainability into it. So firstly, it delivers growth opportunities for the business. We found that by pursuing this new corporate mission, that we are finding products which are, uh, are meeting better success in the marketplace. So that can be through more energy efficient freezers, 
which allow us to win contracts with out-of-home vendors. That can be through concentrated laundry detergents, which uh, are more attractive to cons consumers because they're also more convenient. Um, it can be through lower costs and higher returns. So this, this is just about eco-efficiency in factories. We've saved something like um, two, three hundred million um, in the last four or five years through implementing measures in our factories. So there's, there's real money to be had here uh, uh, and therefore higher returns. Um, some of that is through improved packaging and improved materials. I think the shot in the slide there is a, a new compressed aerosol deodorant. Um, aluminium is a very expensive material. Uh, and so we've been able to actually compress that down, get the same number of uses into a smaller can. Again, that comes with convenience benefits for consumers, but also is a, uh, a higher value product. Uh, and also then reducing risks. So on the agricultural side, by going after a sustainable sourcing strategy, and we have a target to have 100% of our agricultural raw materials from sustainable sources by 2020, um, we find that we are getting into conversations around traceable, sustainable sources, getting into much better conversations with farmers, with our suppliers and their suppliers, uh, and getting into all kinds of ways in which we can, can, can bring down emissions in agriculture and reduce inputs um, across the board. And that gives us um, better control, better security of supply, and, and the business case comes there while reducing emissions at the same time. I'll pause there and we can pick up other points in discussion. Thank you. I feel I'm going to say wow too. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm Steve Howard, I'm with IKEA Group and uh, we make the bathroom cabinets and the kitchens and the thing, so where you can put the Unilever products, uh, really. Uh, I just want to take a, a reflection and then make a really I'm, I'm going to briefly talk about our strategy but then sort of frame I think this sort of we could, we could have lots of different rules but three rules that we might apply as, as businesses and see if we all ag agree on them um, and uh, a, a reflection first if we go back to the the early push around sustainability and those of us who are um, old enough to remember this I think certainly includes me so we've had detergents that washed your whites grayer uh, we had uh, recycled toilet paper that was kind of rough. Uh, uh, we had the early CFLs that took five minutes to warm up and left everybody looking kind of a sickly green color afterwards. Uh, so the implicit proposition every time you pulled on a t-shirt or went to the bathroom or switched the light on was that sustainability was about compromise and about sacrifice. Hoorah, that was a fantastic marketing bitch. Um, and uh, so uh, actually, We've, we've learned, I think, that actually we've got to make the future better. People want better. Everybody wants a better future for themselves, a better future for their, their business. If we looked at smart homes and promised worse functionality with the next generation, then uh, we wouldn't be doing great. Uh, so if we think of the, the three, uh, the, what we're doing in, in IKEA, um, we've got uh, uh, three areas that we're working on. We've got a strategy. It's, uh, I think there's a lot in common with uh, uh, with Philips and, and particularly with uh, with Unilever because of the complex nature of our businesses and we framed it around being people and planet positive and it sits in our overall direction it's a cornerstone of our strategic plan for the business so it's one of the guiding strategies it's not an optional extra and it's called people and planet positive because it's explicitly about wanting to have a positive impact on the world so we could have shown the same graph as you in terms of we want to double our business and a positive social impact and actually uh, create positive environmental impacts wherever possible uh, and three areas we recognized uh, it's about our customers and our customers want to live a more sustainable life at home so uh, that's our, our first my first image here really and um, we know from talking to customers it doesn't matter whether you're in in Boston or in Beijing especially if there's a benefit if people can save energy save water uh, uh, reduce their amount of waste people want to do it they're highly motivated they don't necessarily know how but they want it to be easy affordable and attractive to do it and it polls around sort of 90 percent of a high level of interest in the engagement in doing that uh, so uh, I'll, I'll briefly talk about LEDs because Harry's covered it brilliantly but we're also we have a, a missionary zeal but it just comes to my sort of first first rule for business which is go all in and I think we should say the same for governments really if you're going to trans you can't half transform yourself it's really hard to half transform your business because you've got to invest in defending the status quo and invest in the new in transformation at the same time you divide your efforts so we set a target we said we'll ban halogens and cfls from our business with the incandescents are gone but let's ban the rest uh, and we'll eliminate them by 2016 
and then totally repurpose ourselves to just go uh, all in around LED and reduce the price because the magic point and we've not focused on street lighting or things like that we've just focused on consumer lighting uh, so, and it was July this year and there was a magic crossover point where as we got to the price point about a year ahead of plan uh, all sales of other products went down and the LEDs took off we have a lighting revolution achieved about a year ahead of schedule um, and uh, We'll sell about 20 million LEDs or so um, in the last year. Uh, that we're 25 years, the last 25 years. If you just think about that as a concept relative to the old incandescent bulbs or even those nasty, hal those halogens that pop out like this. If anybody's got halogen, <laughs> spends their weekends changing out halogen spots, don't do it. But LEDs in the last 25 years, you know, your kids can leave home, go to college, get married, bring grandkids back, visit you, and you've got the same light fixtures saving you energy uh, every day. And what we worked out, just in, in a European uh, energy prices, but it's probably the same in many US states, uh, this will give you a payback of about $200. So it pays for itself in, in nine months and then keeps paying for itself every nine months. You're getting paid $200 to swap a light bulb. That's a fantastic business, isn't it, if we could go and do that. So it's about designing better products, but the rule is go all in. And we're doing the same thing with induction hobs, the stove tops that you cook. We realize the product's better for people but was initially, you know, people can price innovation high. And we know people have thin wallets, and you've got to get sustainability and energy efficiency into every household. Um, so we said, let's not sell the old electric hobs, the old electric stovetops. Uh, uh, let's, uh, by 2016, eliminate those. And we need the price development on induction hobs. Induction hobs are almost twice as efficient, uh, and they cook nearly twice as fast. And we did some work with some families, and they worked out they could save uh, about two days a year cooking time. With, so you can save money, save the environment, have two days of your life back to do something else with while you're seeing the world under a new light under your 25-year LEDs. That's the sort of sustainability that people want. And we're doing that across the whole range of products. So we've now identified products for a more sustainable life at home. We're using sales steering. We're aggressively purposing the business to make sure that we bring those in reach of our customers. And we have uh, 700 million visitors a year in our stores, about 1.3 billion on our web website. Um, the next area of our business is, well, that's an uh, induction hub. I've got one at home. If you've not got one, just go and do it. Um, is to be energy and resource independence as a business. And I'll talk about the resource side first. Uh, there's, there's something in uh, where we think of innovation. We, we always think of innovation as uh, it's about solar panels or it's about some super cool uh, chemical technology for, uh, for bioplastics. Um, simple innovation can be flat packing a sofa. So uh, this is a bit like some of your examples, Tom, really. Uh, and we, we took our most popular sofa, an Ectorp sofa, and did, that was the first one to flat pack. Um, and you, said you could ship three times as many. The customer could also get it home more easily. It took them 15 minutes to put the back up, and it had the same performance as before. Uh, so if you imagine from a fuel efficiency point of view, you'd wait 300 years to get a threefold increase in fuel efficiency, whereas one designer with a bit of ingenuity can do that. We've also uh, rolled up mattresses. This is, doesn't sound like radical innovation. Uh, when you're in the same room as NASA, rolling mattresses may sound simple, but it is. But when you chase these things, that's halved the CO2 emissions of mattresses, and you lower the price, you pass on the price saving to customers, and it's easier for them to get the mattress home. Simple innovations that you can do, as well as technology development. Um, and we're doing the same things as, as you, Tom, in, in terms of chasing sustainability. So we're focused on better cotton, on forest stewardship council wood, and really pushing the business aggressively. And they're coming back to the go all, the, the, the sort of go all in and set 100% targets. The value of 100% targets in business, people like clarity, they like certainty. And we discovered uh, just two, three years ago that um, actually, if you set, set a 50% target, you can choose which 50% you're in. You know, peop so people think, actually, I'm, I'm in the 50% where this is difficult to do, so I'll let the other 50% do this. Um, it's, it makes it so much harder. So if you, wherever you can, if you set a really sharp time frame, a stretch target, and go 100%, everybody knows. And then people have clarity. There's no doubt, no discussion, and you go for it. So we're 72% better cotton today. Uh, by, fi uh, by 2015, we'll be 100% better cotton. And we've flipped. We're 1% of the world's cotton used, pretty much will have flipped the cotton sector and impacted 150,000 farmers, improving uh, their, their incomes. Um, we love the sun. 
uh, I'd like the wind too, um, but uh, the sun's easier to love. Uh, and we realized that, you know, we're a conservative company in many ways, like many companies, you know, sort of, uh, we like to earn the money before we invest it. And uh, we know that uh, we'll own our stores for a long time, we own the land our stores are built on, our, we own many of our own factories, our distribution centers. Why shouldn't we vertically integrate into energy? We're going to be using electricity in the future. Uh, so we set a, a target to go 100% renewable, but we said let's own the renewables. Let's own our own generation wherever we can um, and uh, do it on site and off site. So we've now installed 550,000 solar panels. I think in 10 US states with the largest rooftop solar installations uh, on our DCs and stores, actually. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing that. But 550,000 solar panels would fill this, uh, this stadium 130 times or you could line them up, it would be about 400 miles of panels end to end. Interesting thing is if we'd had policy certainty in more markets, we could have done twice as many. So we would have, and that's all jobs. There's real jobs in this. Uh, and it's a great investment, uh, but we could have gone twice as fast if we'd had policy certainty in more markets. Um, we've, uh, we've bought, uh, invested in 18 wind farms as well. So when the wind farms are all spinning, uh, then we'll be about 51% renewable. Uh, and we'll, we'll get, uh, I think we'll hit 100% target ahead of 2020. And uh, just the last thing, we just started selling solar panels. We liked it so much, um, and we realized we got fantastic. Uh, when you buy 550,000 of anything, you get a good price. Uh, so uh, we've uh, realized we could do a fantastic consumer offer. So we started our first market, uh, it, which is uh, in the UK, and uh, selling solar to people. And we found people were twice as likely to buy solar from IKEA. Now we worked with a supplier set up and with a, a good partner and great quality, a fantastic turnkey solution, but and went 15 to 20% below the market. So by being really using scale and being lean in terms of your margins, uh, but actually people just want trusted brands that they can do business with. And it's a great, again, it's a great proposition for consumers. So um, we will roll that out into, into more markets over the next year or two. And it's, people can go energy independent. You can. It's, it's such a disruptive concept in a way, if you think, from being dependent on energy off the grid, having no certainty over future pricing, to being able to produce much of your own electricity from the sun. It's a, you know, the prosumer, it's a fantastic thing to be able to do. Um, so, you know, let's, the, my, my concluding remarks, just on the sort of three rules, let's make the future better. It's not about compromise, it's about good choices, better businesses, better products, better services. Uh, let's go all in wherever you can go 100% in speed. You know. And then the last is, let's have some policy certainty, long, loud, and legal. We don't need luxury incentives, but we need clarity over the policy environment. And I, and I know, Nancy, you'd love to, uh, you're starting to deliver that, and you'd love to deliver that more. And, it'd be, and we in the business community, much of us, we welcome, don't care, regulation, legislation, it doesn't matter. Let's just have policy certainty, and then we will deliver the business innovation and investment that's required, and we know our customers want it, and we can, well, we can slash greenhouse gas emissions and create a better, more vibrant, exciting, clean economy at the same time. So it's a great opportunity, and I love the work that Ceres does, and it's been, we've been uh, uh, delighted to help support uh, the Climate Declaration. Thank you. That was great. Thank you all. Um, I sort of opened the session by using a deliberately provocative term, especially in the context of the COP, and that is self-interest. Um, and um, you've, made, you've laid out, I think, what seems to be a pretty clear case for how you're building a business around sustainability, how you're trying to integrate that into the future of the company. But um, I'm sure you have skeptics, uh, uh, probably especially here uh, at the venue where so many of the debates have revolved around whether and how to admit the private sector into the context of the COP. Um, and uh, I'm sure also, um, uh, in addition to those uh, skeptics, they're saying, well, why should companies get involved with advocating for policy? And, and what would you say to those skeptics if, uh, if you had an opportunity to do that? And, and uh, just as a, 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 before I go to your question, um, uh, just a reminder that uh, one hashtag that didn't get mentioned is hashtag climate declaration. That's all one word, C-L-I-M-A-T-E-D-E-C-L-A-R-A-T-I-O-N, uh, in case people are, uh, want to use that. So um, who, who would like to start to? Uh, maybe quite simply put, uh, to some of the skeptics, I would say, I think that's also an American term, it's the economy is stupid. Um, so you can do the right thing, 
uh, for the planet, which I think is even more aspirational than for the economy, because also from some statistics we know, if we follow how the pathway of more is better, that people don't get happier. That's the one statistic that I sometimes use is indeed uh, the enormous growth in GDP in the US, but that from market research follows that people are less happy. So we need to move from a model from more is better to better is best. Uh, so also what Steve said in other words. But for part, is the economy stupid? And then you get simply better services. And I think there, also talking about policies, uh, we need those for the depth and the speed and for the certainty. Um, but I think what is really important is that we, certainly as a business community, that we not only focus on policies, but that we also focus on the narrative that we convince our consumers, our partners, the whole value chain to do this, so that people also increasingly start seeing the benefits, so that the better is best, so that through their voting and buying behavior, they reward, uh, let's say, the forward-looking companies, they push uh, the laggards, but also that they do the thing in their, in their voting behavior that also then for politicians will be the same. Uh, politicians want to be re-elected or they want to be elected in the first place. So if then this is the voting behavior, well, what do you do? So I think those are then accelerators towards this better future. Um, I just think in the last uh, year or so, I, I'm sure if I thought about it harder, I could come up with more examples of this, but uh, we've had our, one of our external franchisees stores in Bangkok surrounded by flood water. We had four stores on the east coast of the US where our co-workers and the communities around them were, were impacted by Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we've had suppliers in the Philippines, in Vietnam and Thailand, uh, and sorry, in Vietnam and the Philippines, uh, just impacted heavily. We've seen our cotton supply chains disrupted. We've seen for, uh, forest and timber supply chains disrupted, and, uh, and, and people and communities impacted uh, across our, our business. That's the last 12 months. Now, obviously, you could say we've always had extreme weather, but it's clear, from our point of view, it's clear that it's on the, it's on the increase. Um, now, of course, the, and I think our skepticism, there's nothing wrong with being skeptical. I'm skeptical about many things. Um, but it's, it's denial of the science. I think if somebody raises it to me in the business, nobody does anymore, actually. Um, but I have, I said, fine, let's just have a conversation about it. Let's talk it through. But say, the, the science, there's a slight chance. Let's say, if you want to operate from the, the point of view that the science might be wrong, uh, then say, what are the choices we're making today that are bad choices? So why would it be bad to triple your effective fuel efficiency by black backing a sofa, saving people money, and increasing your sofa sales in a more sustainable way? Why would that be bad? Why would it be bad to insulate yourself from future electricity price rise and be energy independent through owning your own energy? And it, these are all good commercial decisions. So you can start from a, let's do the right thing, the business case almost, almost always stacks up. You know, if you're prepared to take a decent return on investment, it almost always stacks up. So we're not making bad choices anyway. But I, I think it's actually worth people taking a pause and saying, okay, I can understand some doubt around the science a while ago, but actually this is starting to look really quite serious. <laughs> and uh, for many people, the impacts are really real and really dramatic today. So let's say, Let's, we, have to, we have to assume the science may be right. If you're, a, if you're in doubt, well, the science may be right. In that case, the precautionary principle says, let's act and act at scale. But it's still about a better future. It's not, we're not doing bad things. So I, I'd echo all of that. I think we see something like 200 million euro cost in terms of lost sales and increased costs as a result of extreme weather events just in the last year or so. Um, you know, these are very real costs. It's, it's not just the money, it's business disruption. It's our people that are affected around the world. Um, so we see a, a huge imperative to act. L let me address your point on kind of how does this work, business at COP, is that the right thing to be doing? Um, what I see is that the f some of the problems we're dealing with are getting more and more complex. If you take an issue like sustainable sourcing, like illegal deforestation, these are immensely complex issues that partly um, require markets to resolve them because of the way markets create demand and, 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 and therefore pressures on systems. Um, but they also require regulatory frameworks and legislation. If, if government goes off over here and tries to devise regulation on its own without really understanding how businesses will or won't respond to that as well as other actors, you end up with bad regulation and that can be worse than no regulation at all. So it's really important that, that we work together as a business sector and as a government sector to design smart regulation that will pull the right levers and, and, and drive things in the, in the right way. And it comes back to what Steve said about scale. You know, anybody can go and do a pilot project on sustainability 
and you know plant 10 trees or convert one factory or or whatever but if you want to scale then you need um, certainty you need uh, more than one company leading um, you know I mean Steve and IQ have done great work but others have others have enabled that in a way by s by going first in the development of solar technology to, to create something that you can pick up and then run with so the, the curve goes like this and there's a point where the curve starts to tip and on a lot of these issues we're at tipping points now and I think that's what makes this so exciting and why uh, there is such a bigger business presence at COP than there has been um, for a few years because so many businesses now see we are at this tipping point if, if governments can get their act together in terms of agreeing what needs to be done at a national level and an international level it's not just about the COP process but it's about what inter individual country governments can do within their own jurisdictions um, that businesses are, are right on the cusp of being able to take advantage of that uh, and, and the number of businesses that have kind of stepped out and said we're ready to do this really want this to happen now in order that they can, can, can get some competitive advantage from being first movers and um, but also bring everybody else with them to get the scale that they need. Um, as long as we're the only ones doing sustainable sourcing, um, it's more expensive for us. We want everybody to, to be doing sustainable sourcing. It's no, it, it makes no sense for us to just be us because you can't, you can't make a small part of a global commodity chain sustainable. You have to make the whole thing, the whole system sustainable. So it's all about scale and that's why business and government need to work together to deliver that. So I think we have a microphone in the audience and time for some questions from the audience. Take that. All right, very good. Yep, uh, and let's, uh, if I can just suggest, because yep. we got a couple from the web as well. So let me suggest we take two or three at a time, depending on how the hands go up, and then you all can uh, answer as uh, you see fit. Sound good? That sounds great, yes, great. thanks. Okay, if anyone has a question here. Thank you very much. My name is Harrison Kahn. I'm here from the Tech School of Business at Dartmouth College. And I'm just curious um, you know, on the topic of putting a price on the global externality of carbon, um, policy certainty, um, and businesses taking a leadership role. If your organizations have been able to take a stand or put a stake in the ground um, on whether or not um, you believe there should be a price on carbon, what that price should look like, whether it's a tax, or if it's a cap and trade system, whether or not it should include um, you know, international um, distributive justice, those sorts of topics. What's that process look like within your organization? Have you been able to um, come to a, a compromise <coughs> as a company um, to help um, lead efforts like what's happening at COPE forward? Thank you. Great, and let me add a question to that from the web. Uh, actually, there were two questions, but they're very similar, so I'll read them together. Uh, and these are from Elliot Metzger and Christopher N. Fox, so thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a question from Elliot. Are there any insights for companies who see climate risks and opportunities but have to navigate the fiercely partisan policy debate in the U.S.? And what steps can businesses take to support U.S. policies that reduce carbon pollution and expand clean energy? Let me, let me speak to the, to the first question. Um, we're a very simple business. You know, we make ketchups and shampoos. So having a very nuanced position on, on energy and carbon taxation is difficult. Um, we just don't, uh, frankly, have the internal expertise. But, but what it seems to be in intuitive is that there needs to be a price on carbon. It needs to be sufficiently high. And it would help if it was high and on a trajectory to rise, because that would create the right market conditions for people to mm -hmm. do the right things. If it comes in too high to start with, the, the system falls over. So it needs to come in at a good level, but there needs to be confidence in the trajectory. That's just, um, I would say, common sense. Um, how you get there, I think you have to be pragmatic. So if you look around the world, you know, we're in, um, headquartered in the EU. There's an EU emissions trading system, which kind of is partially functioning. Um, you can, some people say, well, look, it's not working, you need something else. Our view would be, let's try and make it work because of all the effort that's gone into getting it to that point. So I would kind of say, let's look at what you've got um, and try and make it work. Uh, if you don't have anything, I, I think we would lean towards market-based solutions because they tend to be more efficient. You tend to get the redu reductions at the, um, at the lowest possible cost. Um, but it's, it's not something we can you know, genuinely claim any expertise in, but that's, that's my kind of intuitive sense of it. Just on that, we're sort of uh, policy agnostic in a way. So we want good policies, and, you know, that are sufficient to drive the change there, and uh, and we want uh, and, and fair ones as well from a sort of social justice point of view. 
uh, in that way. But uh, we're in the same situation, really. I'm, I'm a sort of, uh, uh, I'm a, I have a, I'm a climate guy, but I'm actually my job is to help lead the business. So if I want to have a serious conversation about carbon pricing, I need to talk to myself uh, in, in IKEA. Um, and now on renewables policy, we've now got we've got a, a great team in place who are actually uh, driving the development of our renewables business. And we do have a point of view over what's good effective policy there uh, and, uh, and what's not, because we've seen where we've had to pull back on investment decisions or where we can proceed with investment decisions. So you, we, we have pockets of expertise, but it's more about, you know, I think clarity of direction. If we can see uh, the overall serious uh, reduction targets that are required uh, and that we uh, know that there are is serious policy support to get that done. That's the most important thing. And so we'll be policy agnostic fairly. Just let's <coughs> make sure it's uh, strong <laughs> enough to get to get what's done. Uh, I think that's probably where we stand. Maybe then also on the carbon pricing. Yeah, so it's logical uh, that there should be a price if somebody throws garbage in your garden. Should you pay? Um, and then maybe something uh, on on what is a ton of carbon? A ton of carbon is two thousand kilowatt hours. So if, like me, and you pay close to 25 cents a kilowatt hour, that's $500. Uh, so it also matters, yeah, then what would be the carbon price? What would be done with it? And certainly 10, 20 euros won't make a behavior change. Uh, so I think maybe just as a, as a thought to give with you. <coughs> then on policies, so yeah, we do a lot of work on uh, energy efficiency policies, on standards, on green procurements, on building codes, so because that's the environment where our products are used. I think also what more importantly on policies so then uh, yeah, we have a bit of a view, and I think certainly here you will agree, that we would like to see our politicians spend less time on agreeing what to do and more on doing what was agreed. And I think there are examples from our three companies that can actually show them, hey, we don't have to hesitate and we don't have to be afraid. Then we hope actually that that will inspire them and give them the courage or the evidence to actually close more ambitious agreements for the collective good. So that's another, I say, thought also on policies. Can I just come back on the, the last question in sort of the uh, in a, a challenging political environment? What's what's the role for businesses like us? And uh, you know, I th I think uh, it's whatever the you know polit th the politics of this are kind of difficult everywhere. Now they may be more difficult uh, in, in uh, uh, the U.S. perhaps than for many other countries, but the politics are challenging everywhere. And I think we just have to be very clear. You know, you can see. As a business, you can see the impacts. You've made a decision as a business about the direction you're going to go in and just say it like you see it and uh, be very clear and stand up as a, as a business in that. And I think with something, there's a phrase, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it here, which, but I've said it before, so in the, the spirit of transparency, you know, uh, the, uh, the biz about negative business lobbying, that winners go to market and losers go to Washington. And you could say the same thing about Brussels or wherever, that about negative lobbying. and. Um, that I think there's a, a silent majority of, of business businesses and business leaders uh, that uh, really would like to see strong political leadership on this and effective action. Now, and with the work the series are doing uh, and with the, the voices that we're prepared to lend and others, we need to have a, uh, a vocal uh, majority, not a silent majority, where we say, yes, governments, we'd really welcome your leadership and action. We're ready to stand by, by you when you do this. And we believe this is going to be great for jobs, great for people, and great for the future of the economy. I just, we've ignored a bit the questions that came, I think, from the web. So let me talk to, I think it was Elliot's question about navigating the, the politics. Um, I worked for two years in a political uh, policy think tank in the UK, non-partisan, but kind of looked at these issues politically. And what we found is you can make equally good cases whether you're on the centre left or the centre right. There's absolutely no difference. You know, if you want to argue this from a moral case, a social justice case, a welfare case, you can do that. If you want to argue it from an energy independence, saving money, efficiency, rational business case argument, you can do that too. This doesn't have to be a political issue. It's a, I think a shame it's got to that point in, in the US debate. Um, it's not like that in other countries. You know, if you look at what Korea is doing, um, you know, being driven by, uh, I think, a centre-right government, you know, doing all kinds of stuff on uh, on green growth and green economy. Um, equally, uh, Denmark as, as well. So, you know, there, there are good political examples all around the world where the, the left and the right are leading on these policies. Um, so the US is a bit of an unusual example, I think, um, from my own experience. 
Um, uh, and I would encourage, you know, there are champions of this um, issue on either side of the political divide. And I think um, the more people can do to look to, to the best practice from their own political line of thought to kind of find the reasons and the rationales that work uh, well with those communities, um, the more we can get uh, a kind of cross-party um, consensus on, on the way forward. Okay, well, let's take two more questions. I'm sorry. Okay, well, let's do three, since the three of you raised your hand all together, and then we'll uh, have just a, I'll challenge you to give just a, your 30-second answer, and then we'll be uh, wrapped up. Hi, thank you for your presentations. I'm Lauren Lensmeyer. I'm a marine scientist from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and it's really great to hear the directions some industries are heading and um, greener options, and I can imagine many of your products are shipped around the world using um, ocean freighters and um, planes, which are two major industries that um, and huge uh, polluters and emitters that are also not doing enough to reduce emissions. And so I'm wondering from your perspectives whether your greener choices can maybe um, influence um, the shipping industry. Thank you. Um, I'm Bill Simplosky Jarman with the Presbyterian Church USA. And I was wondering what your experience is with, uh, as, um, with your investors. Are the analysts that follow you understanding what you're trying to do? Are the investors who are demanding more quarterly, short-term profits uh, on board with your long-term directions? And uh, what your reactions might be to how we can educate investors on this? Thank you. My name is Rosalind Reeve. I'm with Ateneo School of Government in the Philippines, and I also work with C4, which is um, Forest Research Institute. Um, I'm interested in um, what changes behavior in markets for forest products, obviously including timber, and, um, and agricultural products. And, um, and so what I really want to know is uh, what strategies have you found work best? So, um, yes, that's... Great, so influencing shipping, informing investors, and strategies for influencing uh, supply chains in the forestry and agriculture sector. <coughs> you go first. Um, we're privately held, so I, I'll leave uh, the investor question to, to one of the guys here, but I think the strategies we do are good commercial strategies, so it's just to stand up for them. Um, on the air and shipping, we don't air freight anything. Uh, um, uh, by purposefully, and we hate sweet air. We have a war against sweet air. Sweet air is the stuff you have in containers, the empty space that you pay for anyway that causes emissions. Um, and it's bad for customers, bad for the environment, and we don't like it. So we, we maximize filling rates and we design for filling rates. But we've had a dialogue with the shipping industry as well to see what the, the most important thing we can do is fill containers and actually have really smart logistics to get from A to B, you know, the shortest possible distance with the fullest containers with flat packed products, which you might have noticed if you went to IKEA. Um, the, uh, uh, but I think there's opportunity to do more than that. On the, the um, I think the Lacey Act has been great and the, the, Euro the regulations that we've seen in Australia, in Europe and in the US on uh, saying that, uh, amazingly enough, it's actually illegal uh, to deal in illegal uh, forestry products. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing. It took to the 21st century to get to that point in a way when you say it like that. But that's been really helpful, I think, to reinforce the business case. Uh, but we already had, we, we had 16 foresters working in, uh, in IKEA and we've been using the Forest Stewardship Council. So we work with partners and actually through partners in the last 10 years, we've had about 80 million acres that we've helped get certified. Uh, that's an area about the size of Germany or something. And we're going to keep on on that pro process. But we've, what we've done, it's, had, it's increased the business case. So it's been great. Uh, really, the Lacey Act's been fantastic, I think, for us to say to, to colleagues who may not have been as motivated as everybody else, actually, we've not got to get this done just because it's the right thing to do, but because this is about compliance now. Uh, so I think that's been really sharp. <coughs> Yeah, on the shipping, so actually the good news is that more innovative lighting <coughs> and certainly LEDs have has it has a short, smaller volume, but also they last longer. So this has a huge impact on the shipping volume. It's amazing. So even the impact on the shipping volume is larger uh, than the efficiency Im increase of the product itself. I'll use that word. <coughs> <laughs> then, yeah, on, on the analysts, I think more and more you see the analyst community, they see that the sustainability agenda is synonymous with an innovation agenda. 
and they know that companies can't grow by only managing costs. Uh, they know that companies grow by innovating. So in that sense, uh, that also gets gen generally rewarded. On the behavior, I think uh, the, the main challenge, if I would summarize it, is that we are trying to change the paradigm in the lighting market, which certainly in the consumer domain, and that is why you had all these shoddy incandescents, was very much focused on the price of a lamp. The next step is, is of course, to focus on the cost of lighting. So actually it has all the economics. But the third step, and that is where we are now entering, is to look at the value of light. So how much does it matter to you? Where you live, where you work, where you leisure? And that's making a big difference. So in that sense, uh, maybe to end on a philosophical note, uh, you can really uh, then pursue your self-interest by investing in the common interest. I think that's also a smarter way to go forward because if you take a shortcut, any argument that I hear in a shortcut, eventually is that people then start shooting themselves in the foot. So self-interest through the common interest. And let me, let me take the questions in the, in the reverse order. So what's been most effective market signals? So, you know, when we issued a statement saying all of our palm oil was going to be s certified sustainable by uh, 2020 and then we brought it back um, 2015, um, that was a huge signal to our suppliers. We said, if you want to be supplying us in future, then you better get with the program, you know. Uh, and, of course, you can't do that on your own. We're only one company, so the next step is, is the scale question. So we went to the Consumer Goods Forum. Uh, and we're part of the group that said, let's get a consumer goods forum resolution that we want no net deforestation in our supply chains by 2020. And suddenly you've got 400 companies saying, we don't think it's acceptable. So if you're a supplier to the consumer goods and retail industries and you have 400 companies saying, after 2020, if you want to be supplying us, you know, you don't need really much more of a, a, a push than that. Of course, there's work to do in terms of how do you actually then make it happen on the ground? And there you have to work with, with governments and the suppliers and the, the people actually growing the stuff uh, to try and stop them chopping down forests in different ways. Um, but essentially, the biggest single enabler, none of that would work unless there was a clear market demand. Um, on the investors, um, our CEO has been very outspoken about the fact that he doesn't work for the investors, he works for the consumer. And that if we look after the consumer, then the investors will be rewarded. And that that's the proper order of things. Um, and that's a very bold statement. He's had a lot of praise for it, but uh, it makes a lot of sense to us inside the business because we're a consumer-focused business. So it makes much more sense to be really trying to look after the consumer and their interests rather than trying to look after the consumer, but also trying to look after the investors because it's hard to do two things at the same time, especially if you're a guy. So um, we focus on the consumer. Our understanding of consumers is is becoming more holistic as we think about consumers, their their lives, their aspirations, what they want, what they want for themselves, what they want for their children. And we've just put out a, 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 a Unilever video today talking about that and future generations and what we should all be trying to do. But um, it comes from a very deep consumer insight into what, what people want. And people don't just want a cheap product now, they want a better life. Um, and then finally on shipping, um, uh, this is going to be an unsatisfactory answer, but I do know that we are involved in something called the Sustainable Shipping Initiative, which is being convened by um, Forum for the Future, who are based in the UK, but also have an office in the US. Uh, and I don't know too much more about that, but, but the other thing I would flag on that is that if you go back to that value chain chart I shared, the distribution is something like 2% of the footprint. So even if we wiped out our shipping emissions, and not all of that will be shipping, a lot of that will be trucks moving stuff around, but even if we wiped out all of our transport emissions, we'd only lose 2% of our, our value chain footprint, and we've got a target to kind of roughly halve it. So. Thank you very much. Um, if you are interested in learning more about either series or the Climate Declaration, you can go to the URL on the screen. That's www.climatedeclaration.us. Uh, and please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Chair Sutley. And thanks to all of you. Uh, just so you know, tomorrow at 11 a.m., we have a State Department event, New U.S. Action on Short-Lived Climate Pollutants. Of course, we have several NASA Hyperwall presentations. We also, at 1.30, have a presentation on low-emission development strategies and some of the achievements under that program here in the U.S., or at uh, the international program led by the U.S. Um, Thanks again for participating. Thanks to our online audience. And uh, the US Center is closing, so you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. See you tomorrow. <laughs>